Welcome all. We're going to talk about a deeper understanding of stocked crinoids. Um, and the main focus today is why today stocked crinoids only live in deep water. Oh, anyone here ever gone fossil collecting uh, and collected some fossils? What about crinoid fossils? Yeah, so you probably recognize uh, crinoid fossils from pictures. They can look often in these rounds with a hole in them. So they don't actually look all that excited when you collect them. Uh, they're known locally actually as Indian beads um, because you can string them on a necklace. Some other ways you might find them is these same round bits stacked. And then if you're really lucky, you might get one with actually a crown on it. Um, so all of these pieces kind of come together to make what you find in a fossil crinoid. And one of the really cool things about fossil crinoids is you find them around the world and you find them even today. But a lot of people don't know the stocked crinoid still exists. And that's because you need a submarine to get to them, basically. Uh, the shallowest you can find a stocked crinoid today in modern uh, times is about 100 meters, so 300 feet. Um, and that's actually off of Japan. That's the only place they're that shallow. Everywhere else, it's more like 500 to 600 feet before you see them. So these are extremely deep animals, and we only re rediscovered them in the 18, late 18th century when we were actually dredging in the bottom of the ocean. That's when you take a giant net, you throw it over from the back of the boat, and you pull up whatever you can scrape from the ocean floor. Uh, today, we get to use slightly more sophisticated methods. Um, in this case, a submarine with a stick on the front. So for those of you that don't know what crinoids are, they belong to one of my favorite groups of animals on the planet, the Echinodermata. And if you guys ever gone to the beach and you collected a starfish or you got really unlucky and stepped on a sea urchin, uh, which hopefully no one has done, but can be pretty painful. I found the laser pointer. Um, that's what this group is. But the ones that we look at are these guys. So it's unlikely you've seen one of these um, in real life. And if you have, congratulations, you're one of a select few. Um, but if you, anyone here dive, snorkel, um, been to the Philippines, no, it gets a little bit more complicated, yeah. Uh, they're not as common in the Caribbean, although you can see them in the Caribbean. Uh, but in the Philippines, it's like every five feet, you actually get a stockless version of the crinoids, which we'll talk about in a moment. But these guys, the stock crinoids, you're not going to see them unless you go down in the sub or watch a lot of NOAA videos, which I highly recommend if you need some Saturday afternoon watching. They send down a lot of remote op operated vehicles. You guys can just watch their stream, and it's mostly a lot of scientists nerding out when they see something cool like a shell. So these stock crinoids, this is actually a stock crinoid known as uh, Cenometra, and I took this photo about 500 feet deep off of Roatan, Honduras. So to give you a sense of scale, um, this crown is actually about just under, it's about 10 inches across. So they're actually relatively large. Um, and if you guys want to come up afterwards, I have some actually in a jar here. Um, and they do a lot of really cool things, which I would love to discuss with you afterwards, although I'm not going to focus on them today. Um, because the two I'm going to focus on today are actually this little guy next to it, which is its stockless brethren. Um, and stockless is a bit of a misnomer. Um, this is actually a crinoid that, when it was very, very young, looked like this, but super small. It was about this big, it had its tiny stalk, and it had its tiny crown. And then it says, I'm an adult now, I don't need a stalk, and it actually basically self-decapitates and swims off using its arms. So they cut themselves off from the stalk, and those are the ones we still find in the shallow water today. So I'll be talking a lot about those guys. And this is just to show you the fossil record a little bit, because I want to put a shameless plug here. Everyone likes to talk about dinosaurs. You know, dinosaurs are super cool. They died out. Crinoids didn't. They've been 450 million years on this planet, and they've done great. Uh, depending on the scientists, even longer, you know, if you want to set where they have their origin are. But they've made it through every mass extinction. So these guys are hardy little folks. And this is what you would see around 300 million years ago if you went snorkeling. You'd actually see tons of these stocked crinoids. Uh, they lived in these huge fields. They were a, a mass population. Today, you can find entire chunks of um, fossilized limestone that is just full of crinoids. They were a huge component of these early um, oceans. But that's not what we see today, as anyone, hopefully, who's gone snorkeling, one of our members, uh, can tell you, is we really just don't see these guys. 
So this has been a huge argument of why this happened. We can see this change actually happen in the fossil record. If you go out and you collect fossils starting in the Triassic, which is when would dinosaurs show up, if that helps set that in your mind, um, they actually are still found in shallow water. But as we move closer and closer to today, they, all of these black lines, which represent fossil crinoids, they disappear from shallow water, and we only still find them in deep water. So we know they had this very obvious change in environment, um, that they went from these shallow waters, you could find them in 20 feet, you could trip on them walking off the beach, to today you have to use a submarine or other deep sea vehicle to get down to them. And that has been a major part of my dissertation, is looking at why this might have happened. Do you guys have any ideas of why you might leave your home? Why you might change an environment? Jobs, Jobs yes. So uh, not enough resources. <laughs> so if there aren't enough resources for you for some reason in your environment, you might leave it. Uh, do you guys think deep ocean has less or more resources? Food. Yeah, less food. So depending on what the resource you're looking for, more space, less food. Um, what other reasons might you change where you are? Predators, Predators yeah, something's after you. Uh, we have witness protection programs. Uh, crinoids do not have witness protection programs. Um, but <laughs> if there's a lot of things eating them in shallow water, they're not going to do so well there, so they might leave. Other reasons that have been considered are environmental. It got too hot for them or it got too cold for them. Um, and that is actually one of the ones that's easy to dis uh, actually disprove in the long run because... Um, of various factors, including that they survived tons of different temperatures. Today, you find them in Antarctica and in the tropics, so they actually do a really good job across those. But someone's, as someone said, predators might actually have a serious reason for this. And this is the most popular theory, is the predator theory. And we came to this conclusion because although these stocked crinoids are found in deep water, their stockless brethren that are found in shallow water are really mobile. They can swim, they can crawl. And the idea is if you're being, you know, if something's coming at you, if you can move to get away, that works really, really well. I mean, that's why you don't stand still when you play tag, right? No? You stand still? <laughs> I was going to say, there's two options when something's coming after you. You can play it hide and seek style and hide behind that rock, or you can actually try to get away. Um, so this kind of idea that these stockless crinoids were huge swimmers, they could escape predators, really drove this idea that predation is what caused the stocked crinoids, which can't move, into deep water. Um, and this is just a close-up of the stockless crinoid I wanted to show you guys so you could really get a good idea of what they look like compared to the stocked ones. Uh, they still can grab onto things, even without a stock. They use these tiny little kind of appendages called cirri. But they basically, when they release those, they can wave these arms and they swim. They're very beautiful swimmers. Uh, there was actually one on National Geographic. Um, you see these videos. This is one swimming. It looks bizarre, but they're very elegant, in my opinion. Um, I mean, can you imagine using a bunch of like single feathers to kind of like propel yourself? And there's some bird out there going, hey, I use a ton of feathers to propel myself. Uh, but these guys are very good at this. So predation became the really popular hypothesis. And what exactly was eating them? That came down to fish. This is because at the end of the Mesozoic, when everyone was focusing on the dinosaurs dying out, um, because that's what you hear about a lot, fish were actually doing pretty well for a while there. They were having all of what we call radiations, meaning that you're going from small numbers of species to many more numbers of species is a way to think about it. So you might go from one thing eating you to 10 things eating you, or maybe even 100 things eating you. So there was this huge explosion um, in these fish that basically would go, hey, that looks tasty, and eat the crinoids. So this idea basically is we had this disappearance of these crinoids from shallow water. We had these fish that were appearing at the time that were probably eating crinoids. This was a really tasty theory, pardon my pun. Uh, so people were really into this. But the question is, can we test that? Can we look at what we have today? And can we actually see if that theory holds up? That hypothesis, sorry. So... What I, this is where I came in, and I said, well, okay, so the easiest thing we can say here is if you are in deep water and there's fewer predators versus in shallow water where there's lots of predators, you should see a difference in the number of times you're attacked. Basically, how often you encounter a predator should change with depth, or at least be even. You should definitely not be meeting more fish that are going to eat you in the deep water than the shallow water if predation is really what drove you down there. 
So this is what I came in and I said, yeah, I can do this. This sounds easy. You know, you just go out and you count a bunch of crinoids and see how many are injured, right? So you get there and uh, you say, okay, these are the ones I'm going to work on. These are a nice, simplistic crinoid. And I use air quotes there because everything's always more complicated than we like it to be. But one of the advantages of the order Brigetta crinid um, is that they, the ones that I'm working on, Democrinus, actually only have five arms, which is really important because if I'm looking for injuries, such as a missing uh, set of arms, I don't want them to have lost those arms because they're doing a cry crazy crinoid thing and losing an arm and growing back two so they can get more arms. All those pretty ones I showed you earlier that have tons and tons of arms, they'll actually lose one arm, grow back two, lose another one, grow back another two, and that's how they multiply their arms. So I don't want to mistake anything of those sorts of processes for an injury if that's what I'm looking for. So these guys are really great for it. The other thing that's really important about these guys is they are found off of Roatan, Honduras. This is a little island out there. Um, it's very beautiful. I recommend if you're looking for a snorkel or dive vacation, it's great to go to. They have a great reef protection program. There's nothing else to do on the island. Uh, it's basically a dive resort, uh, but they really do protect their reefs there, so it's lovely for snorkeling. And most importantly for me is the submersible Idabel. Now, this is one of my colleagues, Chuck Messing, and this is my another colleague and my advisor, Tom. And this is just to give you guys an idea of how small the sub is. This is about as much space as we have. I'm actually not leaning in because I'm trying to get a selfie. I'm leaning in because I'm against the wall. You're really shoved in there. You're like this. So you better like the person you're down there with because you're down there for six hours. Um, it's that tiny space right in there. And the brilliant mind behind this is a guy named Carl Stanley who said, I really like submarines. I'm going to build one in my backyard, and I'm going to take tourists down. Uh, and that's what he did. So this is useful for us because he'll take us down um, instead of the tourists as well. Um, and he did ha Rotown Honduras because they don't have strict regulations the way we do in the United States of how to build a submarine. So, which is not what I told my mom the first time I went down. <laughs> I said, oh, this is totally cool. Uh, she grew into it. I actually took her down on an expedition at one point. So um, I can say that she was like, well, if you're going to die down there, I might as well die down there. And we went down and counted a bunch of crinoids. And she was like, I guess we didn't die. So it is a kind of a fun thing, but it's a little crazy when you're first going down because it makes a lot of scary noises. And you're like, what's that? What's that? I made a terrible mistake. I should have just been, you know, a flight attendant much safer. So we go down, and it's a great experience, actually. Like, my first time, I was blown away. Everything got really dark. I panicked because we couldn't see anything, and I was like, we're all going to die. And then you get this bioluminescence starting, and all these tiny squids everywhere. It's like being in warp drive for Star Trek, but it's squid when it hits the glass in front because you're killing them because you're shooting through them actually really fast. So a little morbid, but you still get to see them. Then you hit the ocean floor, and these bright lights he has on the front of the sub come on. And you just see, this is just a small sample of what you see. It's really this massive sand field, and it's just covered in these. It's a meadow of these crinoids. And it's amazing. You're just going over hundreds and hundreds of them. And you look at these guys, and they are about as closely related as a fox is to a wolf, to the crinoids you saw 90 million years ago. So you're seeing an incredibly similar picture to what you would have seen in shallow water 90 million years ago. And for me, as a paleontologist, that's just one of the most exciting things you can ever see. It's like, this is as close as I'll ever get to the past in many respects. And then you get to work and you say, OK, I've got four individuals. How many are injured? Any, t any takers? How many injured out of these four individuals? One, yeah, I see a lot of one fingers, this right here. So this is the very complex method I use to count the number of injuries I see. I take the entire number of crinoids I see, and then the entire number of injuries, and I divide them. So 25%. Great, I'm done, right? Where's my PhD? Uh, someone out there is like, well, you said five years. You've been here five years. So I know you don't have a PhD yet, so there's got to be a, a problem with this. And there is uh, a couple of problems with this. Um, and not just that, you have to watch a lot of these videos over and over again to count. So there's one, there's one. Oh, we have to go back and recount because you're trying to do this really fast. It's way denser than I remember. Um, I thought I had the sound off for that. It's mostly just me going, oh my god, oh my god, in the sub. But this is basically what I do. And then I take these videos and I look at them a hundred times. And you're like, okay, well, 
you got six you hours of video, notice. you watch that 10 times, yeah. you got to be done. So once again, where's your PhD? And you say, what's, what's the problem here? Well, the problem is crinoids actually regenerate their injuries. So if I said, hey, tell me how many times you've been injured in your life, what's one way you might tell me? A hundred? Yeah, why are you hundred? Yeah, you're thinking of your memory, right? Like how many you can think of. What's another way? What if you don't remember how many times you've been injured? Would you be able to give me an estimate maybe? Number of scars, yeah. So how many times, our, our bodies actually record our injuries, which is really useful if you want to count them. That's not all injuries, of course, but it does say if a predator is coming along and attacking you, probably every time you get bit by that giant cougar, you're going to have a scar, assuming you survive. So over the course of your life, we can actually count how many times you met that cougar until it bested you. Um, in crinoids, they actually regenerate entirely. You chop an arm off, they regrow it, and you can't even tell anything happened. They're completely invisible when it comes to their injuries. And this leads to a real problem, because I can go and I can count all of these injuries, and I can say, but was this a real estimate? If I'm looking at two populations, one says 25% injured, and the other is 25% injured, but then I find out one of those populations heals itself in 10 days, the other one takes 10 years, we're actually looking at a very different count. Because every time you go at 10 days, you're seeing 25%. Then you go away, they heal, they're getting injured again almost immediately. So when you come back, it's 25% again. They're meeting predators constantly. Versus if it takes you 10 years to recover from an injury and I come by and I see 25%, that means that over the course of 10 years, only 25% of you are meeting a predator. So these turn out to be very different counts. And so when I want to compare across depths, I have to know how fast they're injured how quickly they regenerate. So this threw a little bit of a hiccup in, so I had to go back and apply for more funding so I could afford the sub. Um, and I said, okay, here we go. So we have, what do we can do? We can say, we can see how long it takes them to regenerate with the assumption as faster regeneration times with higher number of injuries probably means more frequent, you meet a predator more often. If you regenerate slower, you um, have, you might see predators less often. Um, so this kind of got us into the idea of we could combine these two things to kind of figure out how often do you meet a predator. Um, and this is basically just saying, you know, how long does it take you um, to get injured and how long does it take you to hide that injury? So that's one way to look at this. We just say, here's our number of injuries, one out of four. We can figure out how long it takes you to get back to full size. So we could say maybe three months. And then we just say what your average arm length is, which turns out if you want to figure out how fast you regrow, you have to know what you regrow to. But all of that can kind of be like smooshed together and you can find a count. Um, so we actually did this with our little, our little beautiful crinoids and we found they actually wait four, almost 1,400 days between injuries. And someone's laughing and I'm assuming they, they may have looked at my error bar here. But... Yeah, the 14 also is really big, right? Because I showed you, like, one out of four is injured. That's really, it seems like a really high number. But then you see how long it actually is between predation counters. Even if you take the error into account, that's still, like, almost three years. Um, and the, the lower end, 900 days. So these guys wait a huge amount of times between encountering predators. And this becomes really important, because now we want to say, well, what about these shallow water ones? Do they meet predators on a regular basis? Can we actually see this signal we're looking for? And it turns out we can. So this is my graphic representation. Um, and someone out there is saying, well, those are really tiny and I can't see. And I'm like, yeah, that's because they're so far away. These are actually all shallow water crinoids, basically. And they wait, you can kind of see if you guess, like this is 500 here. This is wait time in days, this is 500 days. They're all waiting like under 100 days between their encounters with predators. If you're a little, one of these beautiful blue crinoids, uh, Cinemetra bella, you know, great name, means kind of beautiful. Um, you're meeting a predator every 30 days. You know, not great for you. You're just coming along, you're like, la, 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 boom, you have an arm loss, it's eaten. You better regrow it. Uh, Florometra, similarly, it's about 60 days. Uh, these guys are each about 20 days. You can get them as low as eight days. So, I mean, these guys, they just encounter predators all the time. Something comes along, grabs an arm. Yes? Ah, so we're going to get to that in just a second. Um, 
but, uh, uh, but that's also an, a really interesting question. So for most count, we're talking about fish for these guys. Um, so, but what I really just want you to take away from this is that our little stock crinoids wait a huge amount of time before they see predators. And our shallow guys really don't. So when we looked for, remember when I said why you might leave shallow water, and we had the suggestion, it's predation, this is how we actually could test it. We could see if deep water really is what we call a predation refuge. Do you actually meet fewer there? So the question is, what is eating them? So this goes for shallow and deep water. And this gets a little bit complicated, um, in part because in shallow water, we can actually sit there and we can observe what's eating them. Uh, we've seen fish eat them in shallow water. We've also seen fish eat an arm and then decide it tastes terrible and spit it out. Um, so there's really a range going on in shallow water. In deep water, these are all things I've seen around my crinoids. You know, I can rule some of them out. Tiger shark, for example, probably not eating the crinoids, in part because my crinoids are this big. This tiger shark was about 12 feet. Um, so I could probably guess he's not eating the crinoids. Uh, other fish get a little bit more complicated. Maybe they're coming along and eating them. Uh, sea urchins are known to eat them, but one thing we can say to rule sea urchins out for the injuries we're at least looking at now is sea urchins would eat the stock as well. They go bottom up. Um, and I included this guy because crabs are actually turn out to be thing. But you're going down these subs. You're there for six hours. You really don't see anything coming at these crinoids because remember, how long does it take between injury events, almost 1,400 days, what are the chances you're there to see one? Uh, the exception is my advisor and me. Um, we damage these guys all the time. We go down and we whack them with the sub. We whack, remember I said I had a stick on the front of the sub? Um, we use that all the time. We use that stick to kind of like whack these guys um, and you know knock them over, disrupt them. We've definitely run a few over with the sub. We've dropped something on them once. It's rough when we're there. I mean, it's probably 90% of their injuries is right there when we're there. And to give an example of this, this was a day we got excited and we didn't use the stick. We used a, okay. basically, this is a PVC pipe attached to the front of the sub that hooks up to the engine. And what it lets you do is blow really, really hard on the crinoid <laughs> or suck the this crinoid's is crown. So now you stop blowing? And so we're okay. just basically, we're blowing the crinoid till it's see, almost level with the stop. sand here. You can see so it's actually right nothing's happening really. Orientation. So turns but out the, the crinoids are, are really infertile. resilient. Um, and we did this a lot. We ran this experiment a lot. We blew on them, we sucked on them, the uh, we knocked them with sticks, and they often kept their crowns. And that's important for another reason. Because I've been going around and telling you things are eating them, right? And someone out there said, well, how do you know something didn't just come along and whack them with a sub? And I say, well, I do know, because I did that many times. And it turns out that doesn't cause them to lose their crowns. Um, they're very resistant to things hitting them. So in the end, we really feel confident in saying it's probably something coming along and actively trying to grab the crown. Um, what exactly it is, we can't say for sure, because we've never observed it. P I personally am betting on fish or these tiny crabs you might have seen in some of the the pictures. Um, sometimes uh, some of the species of crabs we see might actually be nibbling on the arms, uh, but we're not sure either way. But what I can tell you is crinoids in deep water experience predation on a lower rate than crinoids in shallow water. It takes much longer for them to encounter a predator. And so when we assess the, the hypothesis that crinoids disappeared from shallow water due to this predation, um, this story in the modern actually supports that, or at least it doesn't refute it, which means that we can continue on trying to investigate this through other means, um, but for now, we can't say that that hypothesis isn't true. Predators might have still driven them into deep water. So I just want to take a moment here to acknowledge anyone who was stuck in a submarine with me for six hours. If you think I talk a lot now, um, I can confirm that uh, at least one of these people said I only talked 90% of the time in the sub. Very good. Um, this includes um, our pilot. Um, this is a colleague from Germany, Andre Dr. Andreas Koh. Uh, Dr. Actually, she was from Canada, but she just moved to Germany for another job. Dr. Uh, Angela Stevenson and my mom getting drinks afterwards because we survived the sub. So. Thank you guys all very much for sitting through this presentation, and I would love to answer questions, uh, as well as have people come up and take a look at some of uh, the fossils and specimens I have up here. Thank you.